Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, um, as Jen already presented me, I'm Natalia. I am currently living in Amsterdam, uh, working at the headquarters of Booking.com here. Um, and I come from Brazil. And you also can find me uh, online in any of the social media by just uh, typing in this, my username, which is this. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm from Brazil, and as you know, Brazil is a big country. So just to localize you a little bit, this is where I am from. Like it's down there. It's actually closer to Uruguay and Argentina than it is from uh, to Rio de Janeiro. So no, I'm not from Rio. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, today I want to talk a little bit about uh, history. We're going to talk about consumerism, sustainability, design, and our responsibility in all of it. Not necessarily in that order, but um, bear with me. Uh, and a lot of these topics also already uh, were touched a little bit by other speakers, so I, I hope this is going to complement it. Uh, to start with a little bit of history, if you never heard about the Regimen Sanitatis Salernitanum, <laughs> this used to be the most famous manual on how to stay healthy during the med medieval times. Uh, it was written in the form of short poems, and it was written by the, the medical school of Salermo in Italy. And in fact, there is a bunch of truth in this poem, such as this one, Should you need physicians, these three doctors will suffice, a joyful mind, rest, and a moderate diet. I almost feel like writing it down a post-it and gluing to my mirror to look at it every day. It feels like a good mem uh, me thing to, to keep in memory. But uh, from a diet perspective, though, basically the only things that you need to stay healthy, according to the royal doctors of the time, is bread, cheese, and wine. I guess that's a pretty good, decent diet, right? Uh, the thing I find most interesting about all this is that these statements, even though not proved truth by science in, in our modern, modern society, they are still commonly spread out in most in, and most of the times we don't even realize it like this one cheese after your other food properly ends the meal those who are not ignorant of medicine we will attest to these things um when i came to europe i find it very strange that in the dessert menu i'd find cheese in it uh, in brazil dessert means sweet things right so why is cheese in there so yeah probably it comes from the, the medieval times when doctors said cheese was good after the meal or this one that is self-explanatory. Uh, if you develop a hangover from drinking at night, drink again in the morning. It will be your best medicine. Um, I guess everyone already told this to a friend or, or another friend, right? But the thing to realize from all of this is that we don't usually question cultural behavior. We just follow what has been done for a long time and that, that is passed on to us by generation from generation. Most of the times, it, it actually happens in an unconscious level, so we're not aware of it. Technology also works like that. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, and in order to play with a friend, I would call their home, and their mom would pick up the phone and yell at them to go get the call in a specific room in the house, you know, where the phone lived. Uh, I tried explaining that to a 10-year-old the other day. Um, note that she's not even a five-year-old. This kid been around for, for 10 years already. And she looked at me with this scary eyes and confused face. And she was like, what do you mean you'd call your friend's house? I bet she was thinking more of something like Alexa, other than reality, you know. And finally, uh, design works like that as well. Today, we have this conceptual reference of what design means, that design is the thoughtful creation of products. And in my case, as a UX designer, you can always dig deeper and deeper in the iceberg and find layers and layers of design work in it. But in fact, everything around us is designed. Even the things without the intention to be designed, if, if they exist, they were designed. Uh, nature design based on survival techniques, for, for example. Our bi biology and physiology is determined by matters of evolutionary, de evolutionary design. So it's not a coincidence that we now call our continuous improvement of products evolutionary design. It's copying what nature already does. 
But I believe that we are living in a moment that requires a different type of evolution. We need to think about a, an evolution of behavior in order to keep surviving. Centuries passed since the times of the Regimen Sanitatis, and today we have a deeper understanding on microbiology, germs, bacteria, and healthcare in general. And that allows us to live longer and prosper uh, than we used to in the medieval times. Uh, but we still have so much to learn and evolve as social species. We evolved our tools, we evolved our communication, we grew glo global. From a first world scenario, we've been living in the area of abundance. We have everything we need at our fingertips. We have even more than that. We have anything we can get at our fingertips, but we always want more. So um, let's see how design became this tool that shapes the world around us. And pardon me if you already heard this story over and over, but I think it's important for us to recollect and rethink uh, things that we learned in, in school and that were taught to us from the design perspective. So um, design as a faculty, it started to get traction actually in the 18th and 19th centuries, right in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, and especially with the arts and crafts movement that was uh, emerging from a reaction to the soulless results of machine-made products. Uh, the designers of the time, such as William Morris, um, which is this a beautiful guy here, campaigned to the return of the traditional craftsmanships. And even though it was not enough to stop the mass production, a few decades later, Mohes was actually the inspiration to the Bauhaus School of Philosophy. And the Bauhaus was founded in 1919 as an art, crafts, and architecture school in Germany. And it's considered to be the, the school that gave birth to design as we know it, right? The school embraced the industrial movement that was happening at the time, but also valued the craftsmanship that Morris was talking about. And this is told to be the beginning of the industrial design. And as the Bauhaus founder, Walter Gruppius stated, the beginning of designing for function, not only for form. And to me, this phrase from Gruppius uh, is actually the foundation of what design and usability means. Form follows function, it's pretty simple. Um, but because of the war, the Bauhaus school closed its doors, uh, but its philosophy and approach to design is sticks to us until the present moment, uh, the moment that we live in that is basically the global economy mo uh, moment. So with the industrial manufacturing becoming cheaper and cheaper uh, and mass production readily available to any business, uh, that's where we got now, Plus the possibilities that the, the global economic has brought to us as consumers, we now can wish and buy almost anything imaginable from anywhere in the world. Uh, and we live connected, but we also live busy, quite busy. And in order to keep navigating our busy lives, more businesses are coming up and simplifying things for us. So we have time to care about the things that really matter to us or that should really matter to us. The consequences, though, is a social behavior that developed to become the default consumption habit of our generation. Uh, and I call it the use and draw away mass behavior. While there is little doubt about the convenience of the to-go disposable ethos, the enormous amount of waste it creates results uh, in, an in an outrageous way. During the time, when art, craft, and technology were studied in the Bauhaus, a lot of effort was put into understanding the possibilities and the consequences of material usages on ergonomics, aesthetics, and function. Teachers would take their students to the guts of form and function, materials, and processes. Now is the time we add one more element of study to our design mindset. The environmental impact or sustainability. I believe that as designers, we should be the gatekeepers of what excess means. We have to get to the guts of sustainability. It doesn't matter if you're designing software, brand identity, or abajures. We play a part in responsibility on it because we are instructed to design. And design, in its core, solves problems. As consumerism, and consumerism is the only the, the current problem that we have, even though we don't often look at that in that way because we're busy, right? 
As designers, we constantly ask ourselves, are we solving the right problem? Is, it, is this a reasonable way to solve this problem? I'd like to invite you to ask one more final question before putting something out there in the world. What, it is, what problems are we creating? What are the problems that we are creating? We research to understand the world. We design to change it. Uh, the user experience professional's role exists in this continuum between research to understand the user and designing something that changes and hopefully improves the user experience. Designers have this saying, I don't know if you heard it, but I like it. It's pixel bef uh, people before pixels. In the environmental movements, you, you often hear people before profits. I say people before getting shit done, pardon my French. Uh, but the point is, one of the most important disciplines of modern design is empathy, as it was mentioned in this conference already. So let's really think about these people before getting shit done, um, just for the sake of it. What is the further impact that this, that I am building, is going to have in our, on my users' lives? Think outside your product and business spectrum. Let's, let's ask more frequently. Um, does what am I, I am designing or making or doing need to exist? Is this really necessary and is it important to people? What impact does what I am doing have in the world or in the environment? Does it solve more problems than it generates? Is this something that is going to leave the planet and the world and humanity in a better place? Let's start questioning the answers we assume we already have. So uh, I want to bring in four things we can do as consumers and designers to end the presentation. Um, and it might si sound a little bit extreme, but um, bear with me. As a consumer, watch out what you're eating. Uh, the catering industry is one of the most inefficient uses of resources in the prop uh, planet, even though we don't often hear that. Here's just to give you an example. Uh, in, to, to make a, one hamburger, the amount of water consum consumption that it has is equal to two months of showers. And if you're like me and you like the facts, you can access the Cowspiracy website, great documentary, by the way. Uh, and they have like a huge list of uh, links and research that, that uh, this uh, infogra infographic was based on. So I'm not telling you to become a vegan and join a hippie community or anything. I'm just saying uh, you become aware of the facts and maybe think about consuming less meat. There are ton of, tons of people going to Meatless Mondays, for instance, or allowing meat only on weekends. Uh, no matter how you do it, just be mindful of it and remember these things. Looking for organics, seasonal and local produce also helps, as these tend to require less transportation and don't imply heavy chemicals, for instance. So it's uh, less water and air pollution and also uh, less uh, waste of energy. How to reflect that on your design approach? Um, when designing, try not to emphasize meat. If you open any of our food applications, like here we have examples of Foursquare, Foodora, and even Uber food. Even though Foursquare knows that I'm a vegetarian, for instance, when I type in lunch, most of the options that they gave me is meat related. Or in Foodora, when they're loading their application, it's a meat um, image that appears. Or even for icons, when you're, we're talking about food, most of the icons are uh, meat related. What you buy and how you buy it. Um, ask yourself if the things you're buying are really a necessity. Stop yourself of purchasing by impulse or just because there is this new awesomely advertised product in town. You know how advertising goes, right? So ask yourself, how long will I keep it until it goes here or here or even here? Uh, what we can do is try to live in a more minimalistic way. 
and bring our containers to bookshops and our bags um, and also bring our mugs to events when it's not an online event like this one. Um, and also av avoid buying waste. Like, it, are you buying more packaging than actual product? Think about these things. Um, also, take uh, take back tap water. Like in the in in most countries, especially in Europe, and I believe in the United States as well, it's there's no danger uh, at all in drinking tap water. Uh, and if you're still in doubt, that as I have a lot of friends that do opt for a future system or boiling water before consuming it. It really works. Um, and that as well reflected on your design approach. If you're designing offline products or packaging or print materials, think about what happens to it after your consumer uses it. If you're designing for a client, um, you can instigate them to think about what is left behind when the consumer use the, uses their products and what happens if they don't want it anymore. Design products that last longer and provide an efficient way for people to discard them afterwards. Uh, here is also a few examples like H&M, they have this program that you can go there and they collect your used clothes for donations or recycling and you even get a discount out of it. Uh, and if you're printing or using offline material, uh, opt for uh, things that are recycled over new materials and even give your users chance on virtual access instead of printing only. How and how much power you consume. Bill McKimmon uh, said that if we are to stay below 2 degrees Celsius of warming, we have to stay at 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the future. Uh, fossil fuels companies have more than five times that amount in coal, oil, and gas in their reserves. And he also says that it's not that we have a philosophical difference with the fossil fuel industry, it's that their business model is destroying our planet. Things we can do, like if we can bike to work, why not? At least here in Amsterdam, it's pretty easy. Uh, biking leads to a healthier life and it also generates zero, zero carbon footprint. Also think about other tra uh, transport options that could like reduce carbon footprint. Uh, turn off the lights when the rooms are empty and consume energy from green resources whenever possible. There's a bunch of apps that already help you with that. Um, and uh, when talking about design, guide your users to think about green transportations whenever possible. Uh, in this example, you can see um, Apple Maps suggesting first the driving option, even though the address that I entered is uh, quicker to access by, uh, by walking or biking. Um, and Google Maps actually does the same, uh, but at least Google Maps has the, the biking option, uh, while the Apple, Apple Maps doesn't have it. And also, what we were talking about um, uh, that before in, in another talk, right? Mimifying files such as CSS, JavaScript, using new technologies uh, that allow us for less space, such as SVG images, optimizing images for the web, also reduces energy. And hiring a hosting company that uses wind energy or solar energy instead of fossil fuels. And last but not least, and the harder one, especially these days, is try voting for leaders that care about the issue. In the picture, you can see uh, the Senator James Inhofe from the US that uh, brought this snowball to a discussion on climate change just to prove that Earth is not warming. So what we can do is research on our candidates to know if they are committed to fighting climate change um, by proposing renewable energy uh, over fossil fuels, supporting green and local businesses, and also a price over carbon com consumption. It's harder these days, but there's still good people out there, and we have to we have to unite and be together at least uh, at least now. Like this is the most important time for it. And as uh, Barack Obama has said, uh, what makes climate change difficult is, is, not, is that it's not an instantaneous catastrophic event. It's a slow moving issue that on a day to day basis, people don't experience and don't see. So 
to summarize, use your consumer power to set new behavior trends and use your design power to accelerate and facilitate this collective evolution of the human race. Let's try using our powers to save uh, the only planet we can inhabit. Um, that's basically it. Um, I just want to do a quick advertising as well. Uh, Booking just released this booster program, which is a three-week startup accelerator program um, so to promote sustainable tourism. So if you're working in a startup that works with sustainable tourism, you can get a grant up to 500 euros um, if you join it. So yeah, take a look at it. It's, it's pretty cool. I'm really proud of this project. So yeah, that's it. Thank you.